My name's uh, Tim Bell, and I'm going to be talking a bit about open computer science education resources. Jack uh, is here because he actually, whenever I say we do this and we did that, um, it usually means Jack did this and Jack did that. Uh, so uh, in particular, a lot, <laughs> a lot of the details, um, he can give you the honest answer about what's going on. Um, but thank you for, uh, for the uh, talk and discussion about schools, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, it's, it's something that I, th I think everyone's passionate about education and everyone uh, is because we're passionate about what happens to our kids. And in particular, of course, we're all passionate about technology uh, in different ways as well. Uh, I uh, got involved in this because I was asked to speak to my five-year-old. Uh, sorry, speak to my five-year-old. Speak at my five-year-old. I always, always speak to my five-year-old. At, at, at my five-year-old's class um, when they were having parents along uh, to talk about uh, what they did for a living. And uh, allegedly, the, the, the couple of weeks before, a, a cop had come in with a cop car, and these five-year-olds were crawling all over it, um, you know, trying out the sirens and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then the week after that, they had a nurse, and she brought in fake bandages and blood, and the kids were bandaging each other up and that sort of stuff, and finding out how cool it was to be a nurse. And the week after, it was going to be a computer scientist. And yeah, how cool was that going to be? <laughs> Um, and the, that, that five-year-old turns 32 this year, by the way, so, uh, which is a very significant birthday, of course, in the computer science world. Um, but the, the thing is that back in 1992, I think it was, um, data projectors, computers, and you know, laptops and things weren't a big deal in schools. And uh, so I had to think, how am I going to present? Because I was working on algorithms, so I could say, well, I, here's a slow algorithm, and here's a faster one, and you know, see how much faster it is. Um, and in the end, it was all looking rather um, hopeless. So I thought, I, I just had this stupid idea, which is don't bring a computer at all. Um, and that was the birth of uh, Computer Science Unplugged, which it, it went quite well. I kept on being invited back. And I'll tell you a bit more of that story later. But um, this is a picture of some school students in Christchurch uh, doing computer science. Uh, what is unusual about this picture, particularly in the light of what we've just been talking about? There's no computers, and there are girls. And by the way, what we did is, um, this was a photo shoot, because you have to get permission from kids to put their photos all over the internet and that. So we, um, we got a bunch of kids who gave us permission. We took all these, we, <laughs> Jack, took all these photos. And, uh, and then afterwards we said, thank you, got enough photos. You can go back to your classes now and do whatever you want. Um, and there was this bunch of girls that hung around the whiteboard. They just kept on doing this. Um, it, it's um, Shannon's theory of you know, the entropy. Um, so it's information theory, um, prediction, and that sort of thing. And, we, um, and they just kept going and got some great photos because they were actually doing what they loved. Um, the thing is that with computing, in general, we have said, hey, you're interested in computing. Uh, why don't you learn to program? And then we'll show you the cool things you can do with it. And learning to program actually takes a lot of time. Uh, now, if you like computers, you don't mind programming in that. But in actual fact, we don't write computer programs for computers. We write programs for people who are going to use those computers. And uh, you, you've probably used lots of programs that have been written for computers rather than for people. Uh, and we suffer from that. And so one of the big things that, so New Zealand, like Australia, has adopted a, um, a full curriculum in digital technologies, um, which includes an area called computational thinking, which we'll, we can talk about a bit more later on, uh, but it includes programming. Um, but one of the, the big things for us is not so much educating the students, because they haven't come across this, they haven't had the opportunity to learn about these things, but to educate teachers and principals and so on. And it's been kind of cool and um, reminded me of one thing that happened here. Some, some years ago, we, we, we were quite involved in pilots for schools and that, and we were talking to a local um, all-girls school, and their response was, we obviously don't teach computing because we are a girls school. Uh, it was computer science, I think, or programming or something. And we tried to put that right. Anyway, a couple of years later, one of their ex-students came back from a large company in Australia uh, with dyed hair, and she spoke to them about her job and what it was like and why she enjoyed it, because it was so creative, making things for people all over the world and how, what her software was used for and half the staff had probably used her software and that sort of thing. Uh, and the school just flipped around and, and they said, 
wow, this is a great career for girls. It's creative, it involves working with uh, people, designing things for people and so on, and got totally on board. So, you know, there is hope. And um, I think one of the cool things is because this curriculum uh, is new and it's, it's fairly new around the world, There's, um, the only countries that have really been doing it for a long time are Israel and South Korea. Uh, but a lot of countries have been adopting this over the last five years or so. And because it's new, teachers are coming in with a lot of fear and a lot of um, misunderstandings and so on. And it's a great opportunity to, to um, blow away some of the myths and ideas that are around there. Uh, and they, well, often they're, they're teachers are pleasantly surprised about what's involved. But one of the things that turns out to, um, this thing of unplugged not using computers is something that uh, turns out to be really useful for getting teachers on board because again, when they hear that they're teaching computing or computer science or programming or something, they just go, well, obviously there's no way I could do that. And in, within a few minutes, we can get them doing stuff that they thought would be way too hard for them to do. Because the reality is this is happening in primary schools. And so if, it, if a primary school kid can do it, you would hope that an adult qualified to teach could do it. We don't put it that way necessarily to teachers. Um, uh, but um, what, um, I might do a little bit of a demonstration. So how many people here have come across Computer Science Unplugged? Or, okay, who's actually used it in a class or something like that? I hope so, yes. Uh, one of my PhD students. So um, he's been researching Unplugged. So um, OK, I, what I might do is we're going to do a simulated teacher professional development. Is that all right? Um, and for this, I need five people who will simulate teachers for me. OK, one. Uh, it's OK if you're a qualified teacher. Yeah, that's fine. OK, we've got two. Now, I do like to go for gender balance, if possible. Thank you. Three, four, and five. Excellent. With five, it's, a, you know, this is my idea of balance. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you may have seen this before, but, um, and, uh, but I, I just want to use this to illustrate a few points. And so, first of all, um, maybe just slightly, so you're not having got this thing. Oh, they got rid of it. OK. Um, probably never work again now. Uh, one of the cool things about doing things unplugged, so we don't use computers, um, we just need card and paper and things like that, and I've got some of the equipment over there. Um, when the data, it only took us, what, 10 minutes to get the data projector going, I think, today, which is pretty good going. Thanks, Talia, who sorted it out in the end. So, uh, but it, you don't have that horrible thought of, oh, the whole thing's off, because actually, so far I've used one slide. Um, so with these five people, what we can do is think about digital technologies. And when you talk about it, people think, oh, that's shiny, expensive stuff or whatever. But what, what is special about digital technologies? Why has it got that name? It's digits, right? And even that's an aha moment for a lot of teachers, like, digits. Who would have thought that digital technologies is all about digits? <laughs> right? Um, and a lot of teachers are passionate about literacy and numeracy and that for their kids. And so, hey, suddenly we've got them. This is numeracy, right? And we're going to look at how these digits actually work. Um, and these are binary digits. And again, you say binary digits, and you can just feel the chill go through a room of teachers, right? Um, and it's, it's like it's the secret code that these people use that I will never understand in my life, and I'll be an outsider, and it's somewhere in the curriculum, and a whole lot of people say it's not that important anyway, and no one uses it, and what's going on here? So we have a binary digit here, and your job in life is just either show the black side of it or flip it over and show the white side. Okay, And that's how simple a binary digit is. And sometimes, you know, it's like, why do we bother with this? Well, if, um, the, the first question that I often ask is, well, let's do the times table. So zero times zero is zero. Zero times one. <laughs> Don't worry. This is the normal response, right? OK, that's OK. okay. One times zero and one times one. Right. So that's the entire times table. And you know, you're talking about memorizing times tables and memorizing rote learning and that, which it does it is kind of handy to be able to know all the multiplication table just like that if you're sort of quickly working out a discount or something like that. But the binary times table is so much easier. And I think a lot of kids go, oh miss, can't we use that times table instead? Because you know, it's sort of anyway, zero and one. And uh, so we can count up to one now. We can practice that. So zero dots visible, wahoo, and one dot visible. Yay! Cool. 
So we've got enough information here to represent a checkbox or uh, something like that. But we need more digits when we run out of numbers, and so we have a second digit, and your job in life is also is to show one side of the card or the other, but your card has got two dots on it, which is exciting. So now I can have up to three dots visible. Now here's the tricky question, and, and this is the way I'd ask teachers, what number of dots would your children say that the next card has? Three is the correct answer. Um, and, and part of this is empowering teachers, right? I mean, now, how many people here are going, it's four, it's four, Pim, come on, get it right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on, just get on with it. But, <laughs> but the point is that when we're working with people who are fearful and never seen this before, and binary is something that we're gonna hit over their head to show them how stupid they are, it's actually really empowering for them to go three as the answer and go, yep, that's exactly what kids would say. And what we just quietly do is we give out four dots to the next person. And the kid, there will be a bit of murmuring, the kids will go, you made a mistake, uh, that sort of thing. But I say, no, go with this. Now, here's the hard question. As a teacher, how many dots do you think children, an eight-year-old, would say the next card will have? Six is the correct answer. Who's it? Excellent. But if you just wait for one second, someone at the back of the room will yell out eight, because they can see the pattern, and then there'll be a little argument between the sixes and the eights. And this is good. This is, so um, one of the um, fundamental theories of learning is constructivism. So who's come across constructivism? So a, it's, it comes from a psychologist called Piaget, and his thoughts are probably um, sort of just common sense, really, but you can't stuff knowledge into people's heads. They have to construct ideas in their heads, okay? And so as a teacher, all you're doing is help them construct things. If you make them do rote learning, they are kind of constructing that, but it's not, it, you know, it's like building Lego following instructions. You're not really constructing something, um, but you kind of have constructed it. But if you take them through experiences and you say, what is the next one, and you let them argue it out, and the eights always win, right? <laughs> of course, a mathematician will say, well, it could be anything, right? <laughs> I mean, this, this, yeah, so, um, but it is eight. And then suddenly the entire class is on board, and I've never told them any rules. I haven't used the phrase powers of two because that'll freak all the primary school teachers out. Um, oh, right. <laughs> We've got a sub. Excellent. <laughs> so the next one is... 16. Thank you for being a simulated classroom. The 16 has been in many classrooms, by the way, so you might want to wash your hands after you've used these. But that's it. Um, one of the... <laughs> yeah, and often at that point with kids, you can't stop, you know, and some, you know, they'll be yelling out 32 and then 64, and we can, you can actually go up to, you know, bigger numbers and so on. Um, sometimes I'll hold this up for teachers and just say, look, you know, there's eight bits and that someone will figure out that that's called a byte. That's what a byte is. It's just eight people holding cards with two sides on, right? So, I mean, megabytes become a bit of an issue and so on. But it's, um... Okay, so let's work out how we're going to represent values just using eight, five people holding cards, because that's enough to demonstrate it. And I, again, constructivism, I'm going to ask you as the audience, and try and bring your thinking to an eight-year-old sort of level, um, and... But the question I'm going to ask you, if I want exactly 11 of these dots showing, do you want this one black or white? Just cover up some. Yeah. <laughs> that is, thank you, that's a very good simulation. Um, the other thing with Unplugged, by the way, is that, um, though I'm talking an awful lot because I'm explaining the process about what not to do and so on, um, so, you know, the worst thing is just a huge, great lecture about you will do this, you will flip this over, you will turn this, you will, you know, it's, it's like... Basically, this would have been about two sentences. And most of it is that there's, there's just like one or two rules. That's it. So you're holding a card, and it's flipped one way or the other, and the class have told you how many dots you're holding. Right? That's it. That's all we've done so far. So we're trying to get 11 dots. Do you want the eight? Yes. Okay. Could we do it without the eight? No. And I could you could explain it, but we won't bother with that right at the moment. But um, do you want the four? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you want the two <laughs> and do you want the one? And so but what's happened is the teachers or the or the class have just said no, yes, no, yes, yes, and they've communicated the number eleven. Okay. And suddenly we 
and, and that is the point of a binary representation. Uh, by the way, is this card black or white? No? It's white, okay? And the other side is, is that actually black? It's kind of black. And if you flip it over, it's definitely not white. <laughs> um, but that's the whole point of binaries. It's so easy to build circuitry that can have just two different values. It's kind of white and it's kind of black. Okay? It's kind of a high voltage, kind of a low voltage, that sort of thing. Um, and it, it takes it from, you know, because people want to know, you know, why do you use the secret code called binary? And the thing is, it's not actually secret. It's not encryption. If you think that putting things in binary makes it encrypted, then... Uh, have you worked for the government? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay, next tricky question for you. What is the lowest number we can represent here? Wrong, correct answer. <laughs> the kids will, usually as one voice will call out one, then two seconds later, that kid will call out zero, constructed the knowledge for themselves. Is that a side bit or I often get that question from eight-year-olds, actually. Is, is there a sign bit? Yeah. Do you miss the usually the same kid who takes the next step? Uh, that's one thing to watch out for. So often, you know, there will be a kid that's latched onto it, or maybe a kid that did this, you know, last year with a different teacher or in a science center or something like that. And, but the art of, and one of the messages to our teachers is that you actually know about classroom management. Because when I go into a class, I always focus on that kid that knows the answers, and, you, you know, you're getting them out very quickly. Teachers are very good at going, Thank you. Now, could you just go take a message to the office for me? Because, well, we, well, there's all these positive classroom management methods, and <laughs> right, Every, everyone else is going. That's why I had to keep taking messages to the office. Yeah, okay. Um, so, one of the things, you know, because again, teachers are coming in fearful, like I have to learn this thing called programming and binary numbers and HCI and artificial intelligence and drones and robots and. Uh, you know, it's just, where is it all going to end? Um, they have 80% of what they need because they know how to manage a classroom of kids. They know how to help that quiet kid in the corner who's just ticking over quietly and, you know, really enjoying it, but completely not joining in the, the discussion. Um, they, they know how to deal with behavior and all sorts of things like that. They know how to deal with a principal and knock them into shape and all those sort of things, which is really important. And I don't know if any of you have ever gone into a classroom, but it's okay for a one hour stint, and especially if the teacher's still there to manage things. But it's actually really hard to do a good job of all of those things. And so one of the encouraging messages for existing teachers, maybe not every existing teacher, like the ones that just play YouTube videos, but uh, is, is that you really have a lot of skills, and if we just hired a bunch of industry professionals to come and teach this stuff, then, you know, a few keen kids would learn something, and that would be it. Um, one of the points about having it in primary school level is that we actually, um, the, the curriculum is covered, is taken by all students, right? So you, you will get a gender balance. In fact, you'll get slightly more females, because that's just how many there are. And so um, it's, it's a chance for kids to go, hey, this is cool. Because the other thing is, before adolescence, if something's kind of cool, it's just cool. And, and, I'm, and yes, knowing binary numbers and working with them, well, you know, it comes up every so often when you're working out a, I don't know, an IP number or something like that. But it's knowing what's happening underneath is really important to some people. Um, and just knowing that, sort of breaking the power of some of that jargon uh, and I remember working with one class and a, a girl, little girl said to me, why do you use such big words for such simple ideas? Um, and that, that's a lot of, lot of it, is that many of these things, you know, I mean, all the topics that we teach, whether it's physics or science or literature or whatever in school, we find a way that an eight-year-old can hopefully get their head around it and even de maybe develop a passion for it. Or for me, just as importantly, find out that although it's got computers in it, it's not that interesting for me, you know. Um, you have to talk to people, you have to find out their requirements, you have to solve problems for them, you have to sort out when they mess up their computer without actually yelling at them, you know. Uh, and so, uh, and this is a, you know, it gives us an opportunity to talk to teachers rather than go, oh, this programming is really good, girls will be good at it, just, you know, get stuck into it. That doesn't give them anything to hang, hang things on. But if we can give them an experience. And so with, these things, despite me going on and on, um, that can be about a five minute experience where they come away going, I could do that with my class, and I can see the learning in it, I can see the value, there's communication, literacy, numeracy, reasoning, all sorts of stuff going on, 
Um, and then you say, oh, by the way, that was one of the lines in the curriculum that was freaking you out. Um, so a lot of it is just giving the teachers the opportunity to do that. And the same happens, of course, with other things. Programming is something that requires time on task, but if kids get into adolescence with the experience, we don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I don't think it's a bad thing, uh, because by that point, what, um, identity during adolescence is based more on what your friends think. Okay? Um, probably the exception will be nearly every adolescent in this room. Uh, but <laughs> um, in general, if, you know, like, do you like computer programming? Hang on a minute, I'll just ask my friends. Do I like computer? Oh, social survey? Okay, right. No, I don't like computer programming. I'd, I'd, I'd be unfriended by everyone if I was a computer programmer. Uh, whereas if they've developed the passion earlier on, then it becomes cool. And so we are seeing this. And so for me, um, when we adopted computer science into the high school curriculum even, the big effect wasn't, well, we, we, all universities are getting bigger and bigger numbers of kids coming in to do computer science, but the biggest effect that I thought was significant is the number of women coming in doubled the very first year that that group came through because they knew what it was. Yeah. Um, just pull your clap too loudly. It went from a single digit to double digits. Um, but the year after it doubled again, it was four times as many. And, uh, and now it's got to that critical mass where I think if we try and stand in the way of them, I would be bulldozed out of the way, which is awesome. Uh, because it, you know that's a lot of it is how do we get that critical mass so that people who can find their passion and also find out that it's not their passion okay and we've just done that with five cards <laughs> okay thank you very much to our bits by the way <laughs> oh. thank you Jet. <laughs> um, now there's um, in actual fact, for kids to get a proper experience, often they'll do it more with individual cards on a desk or something like that. Um, and, of course, the, the more rough they are, the better. I mean, sometimes I've been in a restaurant and someone says, how could you teach computer science without computers? And you just, just grab a paper napkin, tear it up, put some dots on it or whatever. The reason for the dots, by the way, is young kids can count. So you don't even need the numbers. Um, they're just counting how many dots. Um, and the, you can see there's actually all sorts of interesting logic in that going on. Um, now, the next question I would ask them is, if I only had those five cards, and we will have done some counting and figured out you can do any number from zero to big, biggest number? 31, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, the guy on the end's hiding a bit. Um, and, and so, but then we get that whole reasoning about, yeah, every time we add a card, it's twice as powerful. Um, you know, if we go, and then this affects us because if your security key, if you add one more bit to it, is it just a little bit harder? You know, no, it's twice as, theoretically twice as difficult to crack and that sort of thing. Um, IP numbers, you know, we ran out of IP4 numbers and so, you know, if, how many bits have we added to them? Has that doubled the range? Well, actually, no. <laughs> uh, one of the cool things with this is generally it's not what you expect four times as many bits in an IP address and you get a lot more than four times the range, that, that kind of thing going on. Um, the, and then integration, um, some kids um, doing art with it, hiding messages in art and in music, uh, we've got quite a bit of music around now that, that's got hidden messages in it and that sort of stuff. Uh, but one question is that, that I ask kids, how, how would we communicate the alphabet with, if all I can transmit is a digit from a number from zero to 31? And normally we'd get the answer. You want to suggest an alphabet? Yeah, A is one. It's like nine times out of ten, A is one, B is two. One of my favourite classes. One boy said, "Oh, A could be three, B could be eleven, C could be 20. Um But you just let constructivism work. You know, the, the rest of the class had a differing opinion, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with his code. And of course, teachers going, "What is the right code? What's the one people actually use?" And you go, "Well, not this one." Uh, but actually, it is the lower five bits of most of the codes we end up using. And, and, so, and, and what are we, we're not actually trying to say you must know the ASCII code or Unicode or UTF-8 or whatever it is this month, but you need the concept that only five bits is enough to transmit any letter of the alphabet. How many letters are there in the alphabet? Trick question. <laughs> Yeah, which alphabet? So first, first one is upper and lower case and commas and all that sort of stuff. But um, New Zealand has three official languages. Okay. How many, uh, which, uh, and so in the Māori alphabet, there are about 15 characters, I think. Uh, 
but we have macrons as well. And in fact, a word, you know, the famous example is keke and kiki, uh, which if you leave out the macron, it changes cake into armpit. Um, and apparently it's a very common problem that people get offered cake and they think they're being offered an armpit. So it's a... Uh, uh, wetter and wetter? Uh, poo. Okay, wetter digital is much worse than... It's... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, but suddenly, language matters, right? And, and what teacher isn't passionate about language and communication? And that? Well, why did you get into teaching if you don't want kids to learn language and that sort of thing? Um, and so now we're actually talking about cultural issues. Um, you know, can you use a macron in a URL? Right? The word Māori itself has a macron in it. Uh, if you leave that out, it's not the word Māori. Um, and we have a suffix, dot Māori. Hmm. That doesn't matter, does it? You know, we, everyone knows without a macron it's still the same thing or whatever, and everyone knows that cakes and armpits and poo and wetters are the same. You know, all that, it's not really a big issue in life. But it's saying to a whole group of people, your language doesn't matter. Um, and so now what we're doing is actually finding out that, yes, we don't write computer programs for the computer, Someone has to use them, and there are groups that are being excluded. And, you know, as we were discussing before, women are a big group that have kind of been pushed to one side. It's like, learn to program, love this machine, this is going to be so cool. And uh, some women love that, that's cool. Uh, but others go, what's the point? How am I going to change the world if all I learn is binary numbers and how to write programs and things like that? Whereas if you link it to people, then suddenly it becomes quite different. And we end up with the right people there. So the unplugged uh, material, there's, there's actually, well, probably about 30 or 40 main activities and then a whole bunch of community ones. Actually, there was a um, good word that he used this morning in the keynote talk for them, which I've now forgotten, but I'll go and look it up again, for things that people have contributed that you don't quite trust, but um, it's probably quite good. Untested or something, I can't remember the exact word. Of visionary, something like that. Um, anyway, we have a bunch of those as well that people have contributed, but there's, there's all sorts of cool things. But the key thing is, very small explanation, very quick uh, learning, but the learning is constructed by the kids. So, um, but what we wanted to talk about was really um, how to create this as an open source thing. Uh, the, it's, it's a website that's evolved, um, and you think, well, we just put all that stuff on a website. How hard could it be, as it said in the title? Uh, <laughs> knowing nod from Jack there. <coughs> um, it turns out that this is being used all around the world. Um, so what happened is in, in about 92, 93, I met up with another guy in Canada who was doing something similar. We pulled our eyes together, ideas together, um, ran around a few publishers. We got rejected by, I think, 28 publishers, um, which is more rejections than Harry Potter. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and, well, I'd like to say because of our care for humanity, we decided it should be open source, although that wasn't a big thing in 93, but uh, that we would give it to the world, which we, we did. We put it up on this new thing called the web. Didn't know if that was going to be a thing, but it seemed like a good place to put it. And then um, went about our daily business, working on algorithms and whatnot, and kind of didn't forget about it, but it was just sort of sitting there. Um, a few fanatics around the world picked it up, a few people translated it, and it actually ended up translated into about 25 languages. Um, and then you realize that it's, um, suddenly it becomes quite a big thing uh, when you're worrying about culture and language and, and all that sort of thing. Um, but I hadn't realized how big it was until suddenly uh, it got recommended in a draft curriculum in America. And I found that out because I started getting emails from all the around the world going, tell us about your methods, tell us about your philosophies, these, these wonderful things that you have come up with and are obviously doing all the time. Uh, and I sort of had to go and dust it off and look at it. And, but the, the cool thing about that is it got me invited to all these, basically the birthplace of curricula around the world as people were looking at, we should be offering this in our schools. Um, and so I'd go to the first one and go, oh, here's how this thing works and sort of snoop on what they were doing. And then the next people would invite me and I'd go, oh, yep, there's how my thing works and that's what everyone else is doing. And after about 20 of these, it's like, yeah, this is what everyone else in the world's doing and so on. And suddenly found that my research area had become computer science education rather than, um, well, data compression algorithms as it was. Um, okay. The... Um, 
then New Zealand adopted a curriculum and we ended up with this thing that we developed called the Field Guide because there just was no literature around to support teachers and class, classes. Um, and it was hastily put together. Um, it was going to be a book and then it was going to be an unbook because it was online and had interactive stuff in it. Uh, but the whole point was to, to get students as engaged as possible but at the right level for what we wanted. Um, the license that we've ended up with is a, a Creative Commons license and importantly um, as a, it's a share alike so yep we, we get um, credit for it but people are allowed to adapt it uh, and in actual fact that's happened a little bit, uh, translations are one of the biggest adaptations that have happened um, but for example there's a course that Auckland Uni have put on and they've drawn on the resources quite a bit and for us that's really cool because we don't do the work but the material gets improved and made available and used in other ways. One of the really difficult questions was should we have the non-commercial uh, requirement on it which uh, in fact um, I think probably David is most influential in deciding us to remove that. Um, we we were worried that people would sell it and make lots of money off it and so on. Uh, but in the end, of course, it's less available because a lot of people are going, well, I'm charging for classes or I'm after school things. Do I need your permission to make money by using these, this material? And then some countries you needed to publish a book for people to take it seriously and that sort of thing. So we've removed that and um, it's gradually disappearing from all the licenses around the place. It still appears in some places. Um, I, we, I, we did get one person, actually, I got an email from an employer in another country, I won't name, uh, who said, we've noticed one of our employees has been selling your material for a very high price, but it's available for free on the internet. Um, is this ethical? And, and sort of wrote back and said, well, th that's what the license says. We do ask them if they could donate something back if they wanted. In fact, funnily enough, we got a donation from him yesterday. Um, have you started talking to him about it? <laughs> um, but the, we do have a reasonably large team working on this material and it is sponsored by Google and Microsoft. Microsoft Entropies, by the way. Um, and that was simply because, so Microsoft, I don't know if they've got several ways of giving away money. There's Microsoft, who's um, basically trying to sell software. There's Microsoft Philanthropies, who are trying to make the world a better place, and then things like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Microsoft Philanthropies, I just got an email out of the blue saying, nearly everyone we've been supporting around the world with, uh, says that they're using your material, so we'd like to give you um, thousands of dollars. Uh, so, you know, you, you know what it's like, you get these letters, uh, we're from Microsoft, we'd like to give you thousands. Of, sort of, just before my hand hit the delete key, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the, the thing is that our condition was it is always going to be open source uh, and it's always going to have a Creative Commons license and they said, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, we just, uh, basically companies like this, what they want to do is just improve the quality of what's around so they can perhaps, you know, cream off better people at the other end. Um, the, uh, yeah, in terms of other people contributing, I don't know if you, maybe um, Jack, I'll let you say a little bit about that. But, uh, we get yeah, feedback. Yeah, so our material is now published on GitHub. Um, it used to just be a Word doc that was available, but it was very hard to manage. Yeah, that's all right. It's, it, it's on, actually. It's on, it? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so it's now on GitHub, and it's surprising we don't market it. We don't uh, publish it anywhere, really, uh, with advertisements. Um, but we've had lots of contributions from people in like Poland and Norway, people we can't even speak over <laughs> a normal language with, but they all um, submit um, pull requests for uh, typos or additions and whatnot. Um, so it's pretty cool just to see that naturally occurring, people just coming across it um, and contributing that way as well. I think one of the things is that it, it's actually, um, the, the two websites we're running now have a lot of interaction in them, uh, that you can try out computer programs that implement some of the stuff that uh, has been taught, um, but also uh, just demonstrations. In fact, I'll, I'll just quickly do my favourite demonstration. Whoops, which I, uh, now it won't work. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So I took it. The, this, you know, you're at a Linux conference when the, the Lime scoot Lime must be saying there's something happening in Canterbury, um, at, at Canterbury University. But we, um, one of the uh, bits of software that we wrote uh, is um, you can <laughs> drop a <laughs> drop a photo onto the site um, and actually actually zoom in on it. Uh, and th the interesting thing is, you know, teachers will tell you that that's a pixel, but 
it's never occurred to them that a megapixel is a million pixels. Um, it's, mega is, just means huge, right? Uh, and fun fact, who's come from Australia to be here? So two megameters, there you go. Um, doesn't sound so bad, does it? If you're from the, um, from this co the near coast of Australia, east coast. Um, but as we keep zooming in, uh, and we can talk about pixels and how, um, you know, everything's digital like that, but uh, we've got it so that it actually comes up with the digits. Who would have thought that a digital photo is just digits? Um, and it's RGB, and actually one of the cool things that we have added. Whoop. <laughs> no. Can you keep zooming in and seeing people holding cards? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's, that's going on the list. <laughs> you can zoom in and see people holding cards. <laughs> Millions of them. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the idea that essentially this is what a computer can see. And where are the green bits? And in particular, um, you can bring up a green screen photo, you know, which, which, which is the face, which is the, how are we doing facial recognition? And then next thing we get into the ethics of recognizing faces and what color is a face and cultural issues and things like that. Who would have thought it's about people? Um, and yet it's just a bunch of digits. And so yeah, it gives us lots of options. The other fun thing about this is that it has to work on a school device. Yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about. Could be 10 years old, it could be donated, it could be a BYO, that, that could be anything. Could be a Chromebook, it could be a tablet, it could be you know, an all iPad school, who knows what it, what it is. Um, and it basically works on them all, that we can find except up to super cruddy, really, really old machines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and bear in mind, not a New Zealand or Australian school device, but a device that you might find in a country where computers aren't necessarily um, that up to date. The, I guess the other fun thing that's worth that, that's come up quite a bit is when we translate things, which, uh, well, yeah, this one here's quite good. So with customization, um, so this is a searching strategy. You know, we have things that are sorted and unsorted. How, how long does it take to find something? One of the surprises is, you know, you make something twice as big, it hardly takes any extra time to search, that sort of thing. But instead of saying print this PDF document, you can choose whether it's easy numbers for younger kids, big numbers that they're searching for, um, whether the instruction sheet's, sheet's there, whether it should have lots of ink on it, or whether, you know, like, if you've whoop, got easy access to color printers, then, um, you know, you, you want to avoid that, if, and, and so on. Um, but then, it could be a different language as well. Oh, thank you. Spoke for them there. Uh, and so, and then it can be customized so uh, every student in the class gets a different sheet and you know, different numbers. But if any of you have set problems, picking numbers that are a good example is always a challenge as well. Right. So uh, just um, setting the right problems. Uh, so there's basically, you can write Python code to generate these things. Um, thanks to the work that we did. <laughs> So yeah, most of the numbers here, they're all rigged, so the examples work well. Um, you don't want to have a, a searching demonstration where they find it on the very first guess because it's perfectly in the middle. So we generally try and find the right spot for those numbers to go. Um, yeah, Tim mentioned that we randomly generate those numbers because um, we can have every child in class having a unique example, which is great. So when one person does it, they don't yell it out and everyone's like, oh, you've ruined my experience. Now everyone can have their own unique examples. Um, at the moment, they're just pre-generated, but we're working on the ability that you can, um, we'll generate them on the fly um, once we get around to doing that. And it'll be great, you can label it with your school, you can make it for a conference for 100 people, um, just push a button and out it comes the other end. Um, do you want to translate? Yeah, yeah. so, uh, oh, this was fun. So, text uh, translating on these, um, on these printables or resources. Um, when you change something to German, in particular, generally words are longer. Uh, so we had to make it fit across languages. Um, so we have, a, um, we have some code that will calculate the uh, right wrapping of the lines and the correct size. So you can see that on the right hand side that we've got the German text compared to the English on the left. And it all pretty much stays to the right spots. Um, but even just the words uh, culture as well, if you want to go back to the oh, treasure yeah. hunt one. Um, so the picture of the treasure 
chests on those, on those printables. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore because we realize that the chests are labeled A, B, C, D. There are some cultures where that doesn't really make sense, right? Oh, that, that doesn't really work. It probably would, you know, most people probably know what A to Z is, but we want to make it as easy as possible. Um, and so we changed it, uh, you probably don't have a photo of it, but it's now using colored shapes. Um, so you have circle, square, triangle, and then there's ones which are outlined and dashed. We try to make it as accessible as possible. Surprises keep jumping out. So um, we <coughs> my favorite examples, oh, piano keyboard is a good example of modular arithmetic, right? You go through eight, uh, seven notes and you're back to the original note. And that was easy to make. This was quick. And then Tim Then said, the Germans said, um, the note B is called H in our language. <laughs> Why? There's know. a really interesting answer, actually, because um, B means B flat, because that gives you a um, melodic minor scale, which was the more natural scale, whereas the major scale would have a B. So you asked. Um, <laughs> Tim's other passion. <laughs> Music. So, so B flat was the natural meaning of B in our terms, and so when you get up to G, the next letter for something that's common is H. And in the rest of Europe, it's not ABC doesn't really mean much either. Okay, so, and in fact, that's just Europe. And there's actually other versions here as well. Asia numbers tend to be used, and there's um, other notations as well. So, just when we think we've got a great example, a translator will say, "Yeah, that won't mean anything in my culture." Um, and let alone with something like the binary numbers that we were doing just before uh, for letters of the alphabet. And again, not so hard with. Um, Latin-based languages, but it does get tricky. Suffice it to say that we tried to solve each of these in a sustainable kind of way, um, and but it, it does make for quite a bit behind the scenes. I guess one of the other fun things with translations, maybe. So we opened our translations to all. Um, it's free to do, and no one was really touching it because we hadn't, you know, told anyone about it. And then one day we had a surge of translators. About 100 to 200 people were signing up and just started translating our content. I'm like, this is weird. Uh, turns out there is an online group called Utopian, which encourage people to contribute to open source projects, and then they get paid with a, a blockchain currency that they can redeem. Um, and so they were just coming in, translating it so they could get paid. Um, but they weren't translating of knowledge of the head, they were using Google Translate. Uh, and when you have a technical document with keywords, like algorithms and whatnot, um, the, con the content at the other side is pretty poor. Now, there were some people who were genuinely, um, genuinely translating the content, and they were great, but it was very hard uh, to pick them apart from everybody else. Um, so we had to scrap all that work and start again. Um, we now accept it from anybody, but we now have to pay an official um, translating service to then proof check and um, check it at the end. It's about half a million words so far. So if you've got spare time. <laughs> so, time's running out, but um, one of the big themes we have, um, I'll, I'll finish with a whakatuki, a Māori proverb, um, which actually captures a lot of what this whole work is about, this mahi, which is he aha te mea nui ki tēnā ao, which is, you ask me what's the most important thing, you may have heard this, uh, maku e ke atu. I'll tell you. Does anyone know what, what the most important thing is? He tangata, which is people. There's actually three things. The next one is he tangata, and the third one is he tangata. And that's um, a lot of you know, where we've ended up is that you start with people and you finish with people. And yes, we need binary numbers and programming and um, operating systems and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. But if you can ground that, um, then it means this, that most school teachers are going to see the point of it. Um, and, they can, and if you give them resources that are open and free, then they can trust that it's not going to disappear, that they're not going to be charged a whole lot next year for it or anything like that. And they can contribute to it. And the other thing is that when I say we, actually there's a, probably about nearly, or nearly 100 people probably have <coughs> contributed in some way, and many practicing teachers have contributed. And, basically, and, and we have um, a few practicing teachers on our staff now um, so that they basically, if they say that will never work, we just go, thank you, rather than we know what we're doing. We're computer scientists. I think we can open up for questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we use a place called Crowden, uh, but if you go to the websites for Unplugged or the, f I think definitely on Unplugged towards the bottom of it, there's a link to translate. 
somewhere. Um, and on Field Guide, we're opening that up pretty soon as well. Crowding, crowd, crowd yeah. How do you do that? Ah, technical. Fine. Or just yeah, is it like uh, yeah, just a general overview? Because I'm just thinking as a teacher. Like wanting to Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we'll, we'll use the example of searching. So what, um, you know, one of the things. So we don't teach binary search. You don't need to know binary search, but you need to know that if I give you you know a thousand things in sorted order, you can find something very quickly. The trouble is, if I say I'm giving you numbers from one to a thousand, yep. and and I want you to find the number eight hundred, you'll look about eighty percent of the way through it. So we deliberately have a non-uniform distribution. Uh, and this is where you just need to put your evil teacher mindset on and go, okay, I'm going to go from, you know, 1 to 900 uh, right at the start, and then all of the numbers are between 900 and You know, just trying to break any patterns and so on. And, and so we've just captured that in, a, in Python code that generates the numbers, um, doing it different ways, but never, but very uneven, unevenly distributed. So if they try and be clever, they realise that they have to still do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and so you can improve it if you've got a more evil way of making it, making it educational. Uh, some, some of our interactives are really fun. Uh, for the human computer interaction chapter, uh, we need to show how an inter interface can be frustrating without purposely making them quit our chapter. Um, so we had to make a. I think, David, you made this, the calculator? Or was it REM? Um, someone had made a calculator for us, and we had to make a particularly awful calculator. Um, my favorite one, actually, was uh, a checkbox oh, yeah. um, with a delay. Turns out it's really hard to program browsers to add a delay to a checkbox, because no one ever wants to do that. <laughs> but we get around it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it's all, used, it's all written, um, all the text is written in Markdown. It goes through a system we have in Python. Um, and we use Django to publish it all out. Um, the printable resources are a series of images created, um, and they're created into a PDF using um, Pillow and Wheezy Print. Um, so, but it's all documented, um, some parts more than others. Um, but it's, it's all open and free. There's no hidden parts. So yeah, how well does it work for right. students? Um, so the field guide was intended for that. Um, it, it, it's able, you know, it's more set up for an individual. Um, Unplugged tends to be assuming a class size of 20 or 30 because it's an under-resourced under education system. You have to have one to 20 ratios in there. Um, but most of the activities you can do, like, like for example, they just come in different formats. I, I needed five people for that demonstration, but actually you can sit, sit around a, a table with five cards and say, what, what do I do next in that uh, with the people? And most of them have been done in a way, I mean, in the end, some of them can be done as board games. That, that are, um, and with, there is actually a version floating around that's a parent-child version, so if you're a parent with one kid, uh, it suggests how to adapt them for that as well. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and some of them are fine, just one to one anyway. So Unplugged is a resource written primarily at the teachers um, to teach to their students, while Field Guide is more aimed for the students to directly use it on their machine or whatever and read through it and work through it. Uh, there is a teacher's version of the Field Guide which has extra information, like the solution to a question or something like that. Yeah. And you can find the teacher's version by going to the end of the about. <clears throat> this is one of the other fun problems. It's open source, so the teacher's version of all the answers can't be hidden. Right, um, but the way we hit it is you have to read a whole paragraph of text before you find out where it is, and we think that's pretty childproof. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, we just made the teacher's version pretty boring. Like, if you're going to read it, it, it's more like teaching methods and methodologies um, and the solution. You're only, you know, hampering your own learning by reading it. We also made the header bright red, so if a teacher walks past their computer, they can tell which version they're on. So yes. Microsoft, yeah, but it doesn't necessarily have government involvement. 
Oh, sorry, it, it does have quite a bit of government oh, okay. involvement as well. Um, well, 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 when I say government, bear in mind that we were, I mean, this is used in dozens of countries, and so the government involvement is often a teacher or an official saying to us, hey, can we use this? And we go, yeah, you know, knock yourself out. And then them saying, but in our culture, when, you know, like there's Christmas trees in one of it, it's like, you know where Christmas trees aren't allowed. There's only one country that's complained about them. <laughs> America, yeah. Um, yeah, no. Israel, the Arabic translations, nah, Christmas trees are fun, no problem. China, yeah, everyone knows what a Christmas tree is. <gasps> Don't mention the, the C word, you know. But anyway, um, <laughs> but, but people, um, you know, so we, we've got teachers coming to us, we've got education officials from all over the world. Um, and we're trying not to write this for New Zealand, if that makes sense. And in fact, you know, at one point, probably five years ago, people was, would say to me, oh, it must be amazing in New Zealand. You must have this in every school. And it's like, uh, <laughs> there are people fighting this going into the curriculum at the moment. But, uh, and, and by the way, the other thing is, because I was working on the curriculum, I didn't push this. And so we were running workshops for teachers on lots of ways of doing things. And, and one teacher came up to me once, she said, this stuff's all very cool, Tim, but there's this really cool website you should know about. It's, I think it'd be good to share with teachers. <laughs> that was my impetus to go, okay, we will use Unplugged as well when we're showing teachers how to do things. But um, if so, this is just one teaching tool, and, and it's, it's more used as a gateway drug sort of thing, if that makes sense. Um, like, <laughs> like, well, yeah, if you say to teachers, you know, teach programming, they'll go, ah! You know, everyone knows that's horrible. Uh, but if you say, oh, just play with these cards, it sounds evil now, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, then, then they go, yeah, I like playing with cards. I like photocopying stuff. I like printing things out and sticking, you know, and all that sort of thing. I, I, I'm comfortable. That's my space. And then you go, ah, well, now if you really want it to happen automatically, if you don't want a million people holding cards, I can show you how to do that in a few lines of code. You know? yeah. And suddenly they care. Yeah. Did that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Can you print the dots on overhead transparencies and teach quantum computing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's, just, it's just going on the issues list now. Yeah, raise it on the GitHub issue list. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We'll hang around a bit afterwards if everyone's got any questions. And you can also find us online. Um, there's information we can put up as well. So, cool. Yeah. Thank you.